Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Probst, Managing Editor of Modern Machine Shop Magazine. Welcome to Turning to New Heights, a webinar sponsored by Hardinge. Thanks for joining us. Manufacturing companies continue to see tolerances tightening on part prints causing difficulties in their shop. To meet the tolerance requirements, shops often change from traditional turning operations to processes that are more complicated and expensive. So today, we're going to take a hard look at how technological and design advances have allowed turning machines to achieve tolerances and specifications that were once considered unachievable. Our presenter today is Bill Clark from Hardinge. Bill has more than 30 years of experience as an engineering and application expert. So as Bill speaks to you about the evolution of today's turning equipment, feel free to ask him questions. You can do that using the questions pane on the right of your screen. We'll see those questions and at the end of the talk, we'll answer as many as we can. So with that, Bill, take it away. Well, first, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for this webinar, and I hope you find it informative and interesting. So what we will be doing today is we'll basically go over these bullet points that you see in the first slide, and we'll look at the turning market. We'll talk about profile tolerances. We'll look at roundness cylindricity. We'll cover machine design and some real world, real world examples as far as some applications that we've done in the past. So the turning center market as we see it today. So the new technology that we've developed or turning centers in general have developed over the years and they have gotten better at the accuracies that they're able to hold. And we see the market kind of split into two sections. One would be standard precision turning and the next we consider high precision turning. And we look at the accuracies in microns and most every machine tool builder out there today in turning can operate five, six micron tolerances and up. But when you start to have a need to drop below that five micron level, now you're, there are fewer machine tools that are available on the market which will enable you to operate in that accuracy level. So since we're going to be talking about microns today, I thought I would just put a slide up that kind of represents how big a micron is. Because often in this field, we talk about microns and we talk about tenths of an inch. And I feel that it is sometimes easy to lose track of exactly how big it is that we're talking about. So this is just a chart which shows, you know, a human hair, which is 100 microns in diameter. So if we start looking at tolerances of two and three microns, we're really looking at tolerances that are cellular in size. If you look at a red blood cell, seven microns diameter. So just to try to anchor us in really into the sizes that we're talking about when we look at these slides. So the next one here is we consider this about how the tolerance and the form relate to each other. So the tighter the tolerance dimension wise is, the more the form of the part is gonna have an effect on it. Now, what we mean about that is, take an example if I had a tolerance of two microns on a diameter. And the machine that I'm producing the component on gives me a roundness of about three quarters of a micron. Now, the roundness is gonna come directly from the spindle on the machine itself, and there's very little that you can do to change it. So on that particular machine tool, the spindle is gonna be taking up 30, 40% of the tolerance of my part, and there's nothing I can do about it. So it would be very difficult to maintain a tolerance at that level with that machine tool. So when we talk about profile tolerances, what are we talking about? So profile tolerance is basically, you're looking at line profile tolerances, which gives you a profile of form or roundness tolerances and also straightness tolerances. Now these are form tolerances in line where 
basically you just take a slice of the part, one section, and you look and inspect it for whatever tolerance you're trying to achieve. The next type of tolerances you can go to would be surface tolerances, which takes into consideration the complete surface that you're looking at. And one of the ones that we run into a lot would be a cylindricity tolerance. And the cylindricity tolerance would be how round is the part, how straight is the part, and how flat is the surface. So basically you're looking at the whole picture of the cylinder itself. And that is where it becomes important to have control over that when you have tolerances down five, four microns and less. So now we're gonna start looking at some of the machine designs that we have gone through through the years. And basically it's all about the base. It's all about where it starts. Because what made a good machine tool 100, 150 years ago is still basically, you have to start with that same logic today to have a good machine tool. So what would your great grandfather want to know about a machine tool when he went to look at it? Most likely he would want to know what is the mass of it? How much does the machine weigh? So on this slide, I've broken down where we have some popular machine tools on the market today. And I have two categories, which I think will measure the size of the machine itself. The spindle capacity of the machine or the bar capacity, which is in inches, and the max turning length. So the longest possible part that the machine could turn. So the max turning length, in my mind, will define the size of the base of the machine. So two of the high precision machines that we, do, we are referring to today, uh, one has an inch and five eighths through capacity, cuts a 14 and a half inch long shaft, and it weighs a little over 13,000 pounds. The next one has a two and a half inch spindle capacity, cuts a 22, a little over a 22 inch shaft, and it weighs almost 18,000 pounds. But if you look at some of the other machines below it, for any of the machines to come close to the weight of the 18,000 pound one that we first discussed is you come down, there's one with a three and a half inch through capacity, but it cuts almost a 50 inch shaft. So that machine technically would have to have a base roughly twice the size of the machine that cuts a 22 inch shaft, but they basically weigh about the same. So it, it goes back to, you have to have a good structure under your machine tool to be able to have a good accurate positioning machine. All of the new electronics that are offered today in control technology, if you don't have a good structure, a good base to start with, you can only improve it so much. It's only gonna be so good. And where does it all start? The design engineer that I worked with for the past 19 years always said to me, it all starts with the first two lines. And what he meant by that, he said, it all depends on where you apply your rails on your base. They have to be spaced properly. They have to have the correct size. And a simple way to think about it is if any one of you golf, when you swing your golf club, you have to have a good proper stance. You don't set up and with your feet close together and swing the club. You have to have a good spread stance. And that's one simple way to look at it. Another thing that is important also is the preparation of the structural joints of the machine. So on this particular model, it has a cast iron 45 degree slant base and anywhere where we have anything that's bolted onto this particular base, you will see that there is hand scraping. And what we mean by hand scraping is hand scraping is done on these and it's for a good structural joint. So the idea behind scraping is, as you can see in this area, this is a photo of a scraped surface that has been blued in to demonstrate the amount of bearing that it has. And this area here, there is a little gauge on it that's a one inch square. 
So what you look for is you look for a, a minimum number of contact points across the surface. And when we're scraping, what we try to achieve is we try to achieve 75% bearing against the two surfaces. So when you bolt them together, you have very good surface contact between the two surfaces. So you have maximum rigidity in that joint. And on this particular machine, when they prepare the areas where the rails will bolt on, they grind. So the, the surfaces there are surface ground so we can get them as flat as they could be to have a good joint between the rail that's gonna be bolted on there and the surface itself. Another thing that you wanna look at when you're looking at machine tools, you wanna to make and select the components when you design them. So these particular pictures we have on the right, we have a ball screw. This particular ball screw has a double nut ball nut, which is preloaded in both directions. That is done for maximum stiffness. We also consider the diameter of the ball screws. We wanna make sure that they're sized properly to handle the loading that the machine is gonna see. Another thing that you might wanna consider when you look at um, high precision machines is you wanna look at the pitch of the screw. Um, these particular machines that we're looking at here, this is a 20 horsepower machine in that range. And the, pic the pitch of this particular screw is 10 millimeters. If you look at some of the other machines on the market in a 20, 30 horsepower range, you'll see for this particular axis, you'll see their pitch will be 14 millimeters, 16 millimeters. And the finer the pitch gives you better control over positioning of the machine because it's all about the amount of rotation of the motor to move this slide. So the finer the pitch, you will be generally better off when it comes to controlling the machine down into small increment moves. On the left, we're looking at a linear guide. This linear guide, again, it's important to size them properly to the horsepower that the machine has. This particular machine has extended length trucks linear guides, and it also has a double ball arrangement that you can see down in this area. And what that gives us is it gives us similar stiffness in the rail, whether I'm in compression or in tension. So with a solid base design, correctly sized components, what does it all get you? So basically what we're looking at is we're looking to have a very stiff machine tool, has a lot of dampening, and also has the ability to overcome its own static stiffness. So there's a, there's a ratio between the stiffness that the machine has and the friction that the machine has. So you have to be able to come over your own overcome your own static friction. So I made a mistake and I said static stiffness. Sorry about that. So one way that that is tested is there is a test done on machine tools and it is called the minimum increment test. Basically what you do is you take and set up a machine and on an axis, what you see here is this is a capacitance probe and it is flagging off of a, an arbor that is mounted in the machine tool spindle. So I set it up like this and I command the axis to move a given increment. And then I have it set for four seconds. And then I command the axis to move a given increment again. The idea of this test is to demonstrate that the machine tool itself can overcome its own static friction and be able to make the move that's commanded. And generally what you would do on a machine tool is you would test that machine tool at its minimum program programmable resolution. Generally, most machines in the market have a program resolution of one micron, generally. So this next slide shows a step test which was performed on two different machine tools. So the first machine tool, the higher precision, what you see is you see 10 steps in one direction going down. This is the x-axis and 10 steps going up. 
So what this demonstrates is each step was one micron and it stepped down 10 and went up 10. Now the slide below shows a standard precision slide, which we perform the same test on. Now this particular machine has box waves, so it does not have linear guides. So this machine was commanded to move 10 steps down and 10 steps up. And basically the red represents the amount of movement that the tool actually saw. So it was commanded to move down 10 times and it was commanded to move back up 10 times and it barely moved one micron. Now this machine has a programmable resolution of one micron. So as this test was run, you could watch the position register on the control and it was clicking down one micron at a time, sitting for four seconds, and moving down one micron again. So what this demonstrates is the machine does not have the ability to overcome its own static friction with this amount of movement commanded. If you think about a boxway machine, their whole design, they have a very high um, static stiffness or static friction ratio. It's just in the design of the machine. So this is the x-axis and then we turned around and we also tested the same machine, the high precision machine z-axis, moving 10 steps step back instead 10 steps forward, one micron steps, and the standard precision machine z-axis Again, it moved approximately maybe one or maybe two microns. So this test demonstrates the probability of on the standard precision machine, if I, for example, ask or set change in offset by two microns, this suggests the probability that I will actually see that change get to my part is relatively low. It might happen, it might not. So the next slide is going to demonstrate this is the high precision machine to where we took it down to close to its minimum step increment. So on this machine the minimum step that we show here is 0 0.2 microns. And you can see that it performs the 10 steps down and the 10 steps up for the X, and the 10 steps forward, and the 10 steps back for the Z. So 0.2 micron, that's, you can look at it in inch, and that would be 8 millionths, or you can take it and say it's 200 nanometers. Now, moving the Z axis on this machine, you're moving approximately 2,500 pounds of iron and steel, and it has a 10 millimeter pitch ball screw. So if you think about the amount of motor movement to be able to command and have that slide move 0 0.2 micron, it's extremely small. And what that means is all the things that we talked about previously as far as the sizing of the rails, the sizing of the ball screws, the proper pitch, all that matters as far as getting that movement from the motor all the way up to the tool tip. And those design things that we keyed on are crucially important with that. So with this ability of doing small steps, so okay, I can do small steps. What's it good for? So what we'll look at now is we will look at some of the applications that we've done that without the ability for these machines to move at the level that they do, I don't believe these applications could have been achieved. So the first one is a cylindricity test that was asked to be performed. So basically it was just take a large piece of material turn it on the machine and check the cylindricity and see what type of cylindricity you could get. So on this particular test, basically we're looking at, we turned, oh, a diameter 
that was about four inches, and I think we were about three and a half, four inches long. So on a Roncom Zeiss 54, which is a form and roundness machine, we're able to check the cylindricity of the part itself. And one thing that you want to look at, first of all, it has a 1.08 micron cylindricity, which is pretty good. But if you look at it, you can see that it has this wave through the diameter. So what we're able to do with this machine that has this step increment possibility, we can go in and we can compensate that wave out. And that can be done with some control technology that we've developed over the years. And with the ability of the machine to make these small steps, we're able to go in and we're able to take that cylinder and compensate it down to a 0.43 micron cylindricity. So we're able to take and compensate that wave out by utilizing some control technology, but that control technology would not have helped if the machine tool itself did not have the ability to make the small steps that we showed previously. The next example is an example that we've actually done in the field. So this is a part that this particular customer desired to take this part, which is a wheel hub, and they were grinding this diameter. And they wanted to start hard turning it. And what they did was they took the work holding off of the grinding machine and they applied it to a high precision turning machine. And what they found was they were having trouble holding the cylindricity of the part. And if you look at this chart, this 5.9 part cylindricity, this is tracing the part in the vertical direction like this. And this particular shape, it's kind of a traditional shape to where it suggests that the work holding itself was not stiff enough. And as they started to turn the part, the part deflected away. And the closer they got to the support, the part came back. So the desire was to run the same work holding that they had on the grinder. So we did some testing and we determined that with the tool life that they expected, the amount of cylindricity that they had across the parts, which was 30, was relatively repeatable and predictable. So based on that, we were able to go in and develop a programming method, which enabled them to maintain the part cylindricity over the 30 pieces, which is the number of parts that they wanted per tool tip within their 5.1 micron specification. So again, it was a matter of as the machine was turning the diameter, we were commanding the Z axis to move, or excuse me, the X axis to move in compensation method to take out this S shape that you see in the diameter of the part. And again, this is a, is doable because this particular machine tool has the ability to respond to these small steps that you ask it to make. So if I desire over a 25 millimeter move to have another axis move two microns, it, it, it is able to do that. And that is demonstrated by, again, the small step test. So we now have another example, which was also done. And this is a very interesting one as well. So this is a tap it lifter for a stationary diesel engine. This would be like a, a diesel engine that'd be run on a pump for a pipeline, something along those lines. And this is a print that was sent in. And now this print, I'm sorry, but it is an inch. And Basically, what it is on this face, there was applied a 330 inch, 333.3 inch radius. So a very, very large radius. And then they assigned a profile tolerance of 25 millionths to this part. So they're saying that that radius has to be within that size over the profile within 25 millionths. 
So the first thing we did was determine how the customer was um, gauging the part. And then we moved forward and figured out what we could do to actually cut this part and determine whether we were holding good parts or not. So what we did is we received a part from the customer that was matched his profile tolerance. It, it, was, it was within his specification. With that, it allowed us to take it and put it on our Roncom gauge and we were able to trace the radius itself. So now we had something that we could measure the parts that we manufactured on a machine tool and compare it to. So we had a benchmark per se. So the next slide here shows you the gauging results. And the gauging results here is the red profile is the customer's good part. The black profile is a part that was cut on the machine tool. And you can see that the machine followed the profile quite, quite well until it got to the center of the part. And then we lost track. Now, we believe that the reason that happened is because when you get towards the center of the part, you run out of surface footage. And when you run out of surface footage, constant surface speed, the loading goes up on the tool. And nothing is infinitely stiff, so the loading went up and we got a little bit more deflection at the center. And basically the difference between those two plots in this area is... So one is 127, and the other one is 195. So that's what, 60 millions, somewhere in that range. So what was done is, again, applying some compensation methods that we've developed. Some compensation was applied into this area as the machine ran. We cut another part. So basically what you see is the compensation was entered and the machine re responded to it. So in that area, over about maybe approximately a quarter of an inch, we added about 50 million worth of comp and the machine responded. So that demonstrated that yes, I can follow the path, I can maintain his profile of tolerance and again, if the machine didn't have the ability to generate these small moves, follow them, would not, I would not have had the ability to make this compensation work. So to rephrase, first part cut had some error. Then we went in, did some compensation, cut another part, which verified that yes, the compensation worked. The machine responded to the moves that it was asked to do. And then we cut 10 parts to check for repeatability. So basically the idea behind this presentation is to show that there is a difference in machine tools when it comes to manufacturing highly accurate parts. You have to have the ability for the machine to respond to the inputted commands. And the smaller the input that the command is, the more important the machine design itself becomes. The next thing I want to talk about is not only the machine design as far as the ability to do small moves, but also the design of the machine as far as handling thermals and being able to run accurately and maintain size throughout the day. In the past probably 15 to 20 years, uh, machine tool companies have gone down the road of doing thermal compensation. In other words, they would put they will put thermal probes in various places on the machine tool, and as the machine warms up, they will look at that thermal data and through an algorithm, they will automatically update the x-axis to be able to maintain a given diameter. So to handle the thermal changes of the machine tool. Now, we believe that thermal compensation only works to a given level. When you get down below the area of six microns and under, five microns and under, 
we feel that it is a very, I'm not sure how to put it, um, unreliable way to try to control the machine tool. And the reason we feel that is because we have some experience in thermal compensation. So on this particular model that we're looking at here, what, we, what was done is when the machine was developed, we did thermal testing and where we would cut parts for five hours and collect thermal data on the machine. And as we would do that, we would track all the different thermal areas. So we checked 35 locations on the machine tool itself. So this is the thermal data off of one test. And technically we would select, we would collect thermal data on 35 channels and we would get a thermal signature of about of every 15 seconds over five hours. And based on that, what we would do is we would look at ways to passively manage the heat put in a fan in this area, add a little insulation here, and go through, and you would look at the delta change of the part diameters that you cut, and you look at the time bands or the curves of the temperature data and see if you could find any correlation. If you could find correlation, then you would say, okay, we need to look and attack that area of the machine and try to passively manage that heat to be able to control the machine tool. So not thermal compensation, but passive thermal management. And we found that to be much more effective when we're looking at doing these very accurate demanding tolerances. Now the next slide I'm gonna show you is the representation of a test that was ran on a machine. And basically what you're looking at is you're looking at the machine in the red this is the representation of the delta part change over roughly 220 minutes. The machine, in the, the data in the blue is the data off of the delta part change of a machine with no thermal compensation. Now, both of these machines had a variation of about two tenths of an inch over the 200, 240 minutes. The takeaway for me on this slide is if you look at the red, the noise in the system, how the part size is jumping around as compared to the blue line where it's very stable. And these parts were cut in, on two different machines, but they were checked on the same gauge, same material, same tooling, so basically we're just looking at the thermal behaviors of the two particular machines. And for me, the takeaway here is the distance that the machine moves on the red from one to the next. Now I believe what this is, for example, from this point to this point, I believe that's the thermal compensation, throwing in some comp and adjusting the part size. And if you're trying to hold a tight tolerance as an operator, you might find to, at this point, you may say, oh, I need to make an offset. So you would make an offset to bring it back down, but the thermal compensation would also throw in some compensation and the, move, and the machine would move twice what you asked it to move, or maybe not at all. So it made the machines, it makes the machines very unpredictable when you're operating in a very tight tolerance band of like five micron or under or three tenths of an inch or under. So that was the idea of presenting this data. So that is comes to the conclusion of the webinar today. I would like to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them now. All right, Bill. Well, thanks for your presentation. Um, so we're going to be transitioning to the question and answer session. And I just want to mention that this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to revisit the webinar whenever you'd like. 
Um, and it looks like we have started to receive a whole bunch of questions, which is great. Um, but I wanted to let you know that there's still time for you to submit one. So if you want to submit a, with, uh, if you want to submit a question, um, just uh, use the question pane at the right of your screen, and we'll do our best to get to it. So let's start with our first question here today. Um, so Bill, are, is there any common practice that you see in turning applications that could be improved? Um, through my career, I've visited many facilities, looked at uh, lots of applications. And the one thing that seems to be a common thread that uh, we feel, um, the people that have trained me, uh, is wrong is most people when they're doing turning, they're using right-handed inserts. And basically, a right-hand insert, if you look as the machine is running, the insert is upside down, so the, the spindle is running spindle forward. So the forces are trying to pull the turret off of its mountings. Uh, we believe that when you're turning, you should be using a left-handed insert because a left-handed insert, you would be running spindle reverse. And if you think about it, then all the cutting forces are going into the machine tool bed, which is the whole idea behind having a good rigid machine base. So that's something that usually every shop I visit when they ask my ideas that's something that usually comes up first okay um, here's another question um, what is the APEC rating for the bearings sets and super precision lathes uh, we use apex 7 all right um, let's see Is, is the Super Precision T-Series, um, does that have milling capability? And if so, do you have any similar test results for the milling accuracy? The T-Series machine does have milling capabilities. Um, and it has 12 or 16 station, comes with BMT 45, 16 station or BMT 5516 station. And during the testing of it, we did some testing uh, milling with the Y axis. And we had results down into the, as I recall, six to five micron range over 60, 70 parts. We did some circular interpolation tests and the roundness of the bosses and the bores that we circle interpolated with the X and Y axis were in the range of, I believe was five to six microns. But if that person would like to email me, um, I will be more than happy to share the data from the testing that we did. Okay, um, here's another question. What types of industries have you seen the level of accuracy that you've presented today? I would say um, fluid power is one. Um, plastic injection molding companies are another one. Um, energy also, and automotive as well. And tool and die as well. Those are some of the main ones I would say. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure um, if I'm going to ask this one right, but do you have a, a cylindricity comp due to lack of straightness of ways? Well, it depends. What happens is that wave that you saw is a wave that comes from a combination of the uh, ball screw, but it also comes from the manufacturing of the uh, guideways itself. And I mean, that wave that we were looking at was a very small wave. It was somewhere in the amplitude range of like a quarter of a micron or a little bit less. So yeah, it comes from the manufacturing of the components themselves. 
Okay. Um, so our hardened super precision machines, pneumatic or hydraulic actuators, and would it matter that much either way? The uh, super precision machines that we offer today on the main spindle, we have a hydraulic actuator, and on the sub spindle, we have a pneumatic actuator. And a lot of the thermal testing that we did, uh, we looked at the hydraulic actuator, the hydraulic fluids, and we were able to manage that with a couple of fans in certain areas, and it took care of any issues that would arise from that. Okay. And with the accuracy uh, that some of today's turning equipment has achieved, do you think that grinding will go away? Um, I would say no, because you always... With turning, there's you're always going to have weak. There's going to be processes or or forces in the process that's going to make it very difficult to go into some areas that the grinding does very successfully. So long, slender parts, uh, parts that are difficult to hold on a turning center. One of the big challenges with a turning center is to be able to hold the part and not deform it enough to where you can still machine it. And that's a that's a challenge for us. Often, which we often are very successful in working around, but there will always be grinders. I don't think the that a grinding uh, process will ever go away completely. Okay. Um, most examples are shown in what are, to me, fairly large parts. Um, this, this question says that typically this person makes parts that are a quarter of an inch or less, and he's wanting to know if small parts follow the same trends as your examples, uh, four-inch round, with regards to rigidity and thermal changes. Yeah, um, the thermal changes that uh, we reported or talked about will be the same regardless of how big or small the part is. As far as a small part when it comes to doing ID work, there's a challenge with the tooling itself because the smaller the ID of a part, the smaller the tool is and the less inherent stiffness you have in the tool. Um, again, having the ability to compensate for that lack of stiffness by having the machine make these very small moves to compensate for the weakness in the process that can always help. But accuracy wise, the size of the part is not, I don't believe uh, plays into the ability of the machine to hold uh, size tolerance. Okay, um, this person wants to know, uh, what is the highest achievable part circularity for super precision? I would say somewhere in the um, half micron range. And then it all, it all depends on the material. It all depends on the work holding. We have successfully uh, demonstrated to customers that we were running cylindricity below um, three quarters and under micron, uh, one half micron and less. So in that range, and though that was in hard material as well. All right. So let's see, what do you do about the bar whip roundness? Well, that's, that's the one thing when it comes to uh, doing high precision work, uh, generally it's not done with a bar feed because um, there's nothing that you can do about it because you're basically fighting physics. I mean, you're spinning a, if you're talking about a 12 foot bar feed, you're spinning a 12 foot long bar. So the lower the RPM you run, the better your roundness is gonna be. But if you're looking at running, running highly accurate parts, generally it's not done with a bar feed. All right. Well, um, we've seen we've received some good questions from the audience, and um, oh, it looks like one more is coming in. Okay. Um, 
let's see, component wise, are our, our ultra precision ball screws used during the building process? Um, I think, I can't remember the class of the screw, but yes, we, we use uh, a higher precision ball screw. The class escapes me right now. I think it's a class three, but I could be mis misspeaking. I'm not sure. So yes, we, we do use a higher precision screw. And generally, we our screws are sized uh, one order larger than most competitors would use to achieve the stiffness that we're looking for. All right. Well, <laughs> boy, the questions just keep on rolling in. Bill, you're doing a great job here. Um, let's see. Does Hardinge offer specific machines for hard turning applications in hardnesses higher than 55 to 60 um, HRC? Um, at Hardinge, we've been doing hard turning for probably 25 to 30 years. Um, and the the... So our machines are, are quite well known for hard turning because of the design practices that we follow. We offer any of our SP line machines. We consider them very good hard turning machines. We hard turn into the 60, 65. I am working on a project right now where we are turning um, carbide. And that carbide is the hardness on it is 80, 88 to 89 HRA scale. And uh, we're doing quite well with it. It's pretty impressive. I was quite surprised by the results that we're getting. And we think that it is another good area for us to investigate. So the answer is absolutely yes. We have machines for hard turning. All our complete SP line is perfectly suited for that. All right. Um, I'm not quite sure what, um, Bill, do you, can you recommend an insert for A2? For A2 tool steel. Um, well, generally when people ask me for insert recommendations, I will generally answer in this manner. Generally, you would want to go with whatever prep in your area services you the best. The big three, I mean, the big players in the tooling, all their tooling is somewhat similar. A lot of the uh, success in hard turning is the edge preparation of the tool itself. And that is really the secret sauce. We use, personally, we use a lot of Kenna Metal, we use a lot of Sumitomo, and we use a lot of Sandvik. And again, we are repped by very good Kenna Metal, Sumitomo, and Sandvik reps. And when you need help, they respond. So basically, it's about, I believe, it's about having a relationship with your, with your supplier and the one that does the best job for you. All right. Um, so this person wants to know if glass scales are standard with hardened super precision machines. Yes, they are. Okay. Well, I think we've reached the end of our questions here. Um, so I'm going to conclude today's webinar. I want to thank our speaker, Bill Clark, and I also want to thank Hardinge for making this webinar possible. Um, an email with a link to this recording will come to you within the next few days. So on behalf of Modern Machine Shop and Hardinge, I want to say thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.